this is a performance improvement project, but performance improvement projects were not new to GI. In fact, um, over the last three to four years, we've uh, put a lot of effort specifically into um, strategies to meet our productivity benchmarks or RVU benchmarks. So our section has grown over the, in my time frame here the last 15 years or so significantly. We formerly had about five or six attendings. We've grown up to about 15. It's grown in terms of the number of patients we see, number of procedures we do, and the amount of research and teaching that we do significantly. Five or six years ago, we built this wonderful new endoscopy unit here with eight endoscopy rooms, and we kind of separated ourselves out from the same day unit as a whole. Formerly, we all our patients would come through the same day unit. The same patients that were coming in for hip surgery or cardio, cardiac bypass surgery would come in and uh, and have their colonoscopy admitted by the same nursing staff, and they rotate through. And we made a big change in isolating the nursing staff and our own unit separate from that. And that was a, a major um, step in, in terms of the amount of patients we could get through and the productivity. But there came a time where it seemed that we had sort of maximized. Uh, what we could do with our with what we were doing here, maximize the number of patients we could get through and procedures. We had already gone through a process of maximizing all of the physician time available in the week to actually be face to face with a patient. We had already uh, done a survey of our about 30 academic uh, centers across the country and based on that we had reduced the time to perform a colonoscopy down to that of the level of the highest performers. We had already um, essentially eliminated what we call unfunded research time. Over a period of three years or so, we had um, created what, what we found to be the most efficient machine that we could to deliver our healthcare. We were running as long as we could, as fast as we could, and it worked. So. Um, the section of gastroenterology and hepatology went from 68 more or less percent of their benchmark, their performance goal in terms of volume, to 100 percent. Then, of course, the economics of healthcare nationally, regionally, and right here locally created an environment where that benchmark that we were hitting wasn't enough to sustain our healthcare operations. This is a time one and two years ago when in the papers we were reading about hospital closings across the country and around the region. Large layoffs across the country and around our region. And one of our responses at Dartmouth, one of many uh, of our responses, was to um, raise the benchmark. So historically our benchmark had been to perform at the mean, to be at the average of other institutions across the country. When we realized that the 50th percentile wasn't going to sustain our operations, one of our high, higher performer volume-wise physicians, Dr. Benson, Steve Benson, came to me, and he impromptu laid a sheet of paper out on the desk and put all the days of the week across the top and all the hours in the day uh, across the left axis, and then he filled it in with everything he did all week and then he attached RVUs to them and added it all up. Um, I had looked at my own schedule and uh, what I was doing at that time and I, and I calculated out and it was basically mathematically impossible for me to reach that goal no matter how hard I worked because I just couldn't get enough patients in, enough procedures, and enough colonoscopies in uh, to reach that. And he said, look, I'm going as much as I can, as fast as I can, and I'm not even close to this new benchmark. What are we going to do? And around that time, one of our medical students, Tom Finn, who was uh, also getting an MBA at the Tuck School, came up and was looking for a project to get involved with as part of his first year um, at the uh, business school. You know, sort of the wheels started turning in my head. I said, well, it's sort of an exciting project. We, we can get there. It's just how do we get there? I looked on this as sort of a, a neat little project that, that, that Tom could do, but he came over with a with a strong uh, like special ops force of five or six colleagues and they really took it by storm. I was, we were all very, very impressed. That's how I got on board, engaging with Tom. And I do have a, an experience in um, manufacturing and lean management in particular. And I explained to him that 
currently uh, we were at, we were being asked to um, increase our productivity by a measure called an RVU, relative value unit. So there was a very definable measure of what we were doing and what the hospital was doing and we were asked to increase it from uh, 50% up to 60%. I think looking at it from a, from a business standpoint was probably one of the most important decisions to, that we had as far as getting buy-in from the physicians too because I think looking at it and saying you know decreased contact time with patients is going to get you there, get you to the, this product, the, the, the sort of productivity line is not where we needed to go because a decrease in the quality of the care was not our goal. The goal was to sort of cut out the fat from all the procedures while still maintaining the quality, if not increasing the quality of the care the patients were receiving. So while looking at the clinic side, we didn't want to focus on the patient interaction with the physician, but more focus on the operational piece, sort of the business aspect. Of it. One of the first things we ended up doing in the project was taking a very business-centered approach, which was to first understand where do the RVUs come from, which are the few very few key drivers that drive our view productivity. And we found out it was procedures as opposed to clinic work. Mm -hmm. And very specifically, we found two types of procedures, um, colos and EGDs, which had a big gap uh, compared to other benchmarks. So that's where we started really obsessing about and drilling down on. And then, yeah, and, and sort of further beyond that, we noticed that I think out of the 14 or 15 physicians that were practicing in the endoscopy suite, there were eight that were really high performers and accounted for something like 70 or 80% yeah. of, of all the RVUs generated in the endoscopy suite. And we said, okay, there's something going on with these eight that's not going on with the others. Someone's doing this right. Maybe everyone's not doing it right. And how can we get everyone on the same page? They quickly uh, figured out that the the best thing to do would be to focus on our endoscopy unit. That was the area where we could have the greatest growth and the greatest increase in productivity, and we sort of left the clinic aside for now. From an operational side, from a manufacturing side, so taking a look at as if the hospital was a production line for routine cases, and there you can start quantifying how much of your work is actually value added, how much of it is non-value added, and just exposing those metrics, which no one really knows about unless they have some training and experience doing that reveals a lot in terms of inefficiencies that you visualize for the first time right and then they went to seven major comparative uh, institutions that were setting these benchmarks to which we were being compared to and they were looking at what they were doing and how they were meeting uh, meeting these benchmarks and we and we talked to big institutions i mean we talk, we talked to mass general we talked to Brigham and women's we talked to Beth Israel, we talked to uh, Mayo Clinic, Geisinger, I mean, big players sort of in the you know, healthcare delivery field. Um, and it seemed like everyone was doing it better than we were. Um, we got a lot of valuable information, for instance. At the HMCGI, we had about 160 appointments that were lost every single month due to no-shows and cancellations. Other institutions were aware of that and were overbooking, so their no-shows and cancellations in a month were minimal. So that's one thing we learned from them. Another thing we learned was some of the procedures they did in less time than the HMCGI did. Um, some of the clinic work they did in less time. Mm -hmm. So it just helps the physicians to see there's other very good guys out there doing the same quality of work that you're doing in a bit less time. And so that, that was one of the first mm -hmm. kind of aha moments for the physicians in terms of seeing how others do it differently. There's a wide spectrum of procedures we do in endoscopy. Some are very, very complex and very time consuming. Um, others are very straightforward, uh, fairly easy to do, um, and sort of the throughput was this relatively this, the same for both. And the concept came that could we be more efficient in getting more, some of the more straightforward procedures through more quickly. Not to rush the procedures with the patient, but more just to have the, the intake, the uh, getting the patient ready, and then um, getting them transported to the endoscopy room, and then um, discharge more quickly. I think the best, the best example we found was the Mayo Clinic. And um, they sort of have this 29-room endoscopy suite, and it's really, it's a, I, I use the word factory very loosely, but they really have a sort of production line set up where they can get, they do exclusively outpatient colonoscopies there, and they don't have the sort of um, ERCP and EUS more advanced endoscopy procedures in that same suite um, and they can really focus on getting patients in quickly out quickly um, and have superior outcomes and, and safety data with, with that facility. 
I personally had my opinion of, of what changes needed to be made, as a number of my colleagues did, but what was neat about what Tom and his team did was they came in and they did these kind of elaborate flow studies where they follow physician and they follow patient. They did a number of them to get a good sample size and they saw where time was actually being spent. And they could numerically calculate exactly what I felt was that we were spending 30 to 40 percent of our time waiting for patients to be moved from, from into our room to do the procedure. And what we found in those other places who see those more simple procedures as a manufacturing line is a lot less non-value added time, which means a, a physician bounces between rooms, so he spends almost all his time doing procedures, as opposed to be sitting in one room waiting for a patient to be brought out, a new patient to be brought in, a room to be turned around. One of the key analyses we did very early on uh, which was very useful, is we ran a simulation. What if your clinic productivity increases by 5, 10, 15 percent and so on, mm -hmm. and at the same time your procedure productivity, right? How close do you come to meeting your goal? And to our surprise and their surprise, um, the productivity improvements needed to reach their overall yearly RVU target were huge in the range of 40, 50 percent in both of those at the same time. And I had already pushed the envelope in terms of procedures that I could get through and was sort of stressing the nursing staff in, in both in the endoscopy unit and, and in recovery. So that I guess just served as a big eye-opener that just doing the same as they were doing before with minor tweaks wouldn't get them anywhere close to where they needed to be. And so that's I think early on when they realized wow we need to change something big mm -hmm. both in the clinic and in procedures. That's the only way we can get to our, our view goal. So I think one of the most important things and sort of references earlier that we did from the beginning was we got buy-in from day one. So the idea came from Steve Benson, who's a physician in the department. Um, he recognized something that he thought was a challenge and he wanted to sort of embrace it and be part of, of, of the solution for that challenge. Um, and Dr. Rothstein, who's the chair of the section of gastroenterology at THMC, was also on board from day one. So we had frequent meetings with, with those gentlemen um, and all the docs in the department on sort of multiple occasions. So when we finally delivered the, the ultimate recommendations, um, I would say no one was surprised, but also it, it wasn't just a matter of surprise, it was the fact that everything we were, we were delivering was never from a you need to work harder, you need to work more standpoint, it was let us show you how you can work better and more efficiently in your space. So one of their ideas was for a physician to work out of two endoscopy rooms at the same time. We would need essentially twice the support staff because each endoscopy requires a nurse and a tech. So now we need two rooms, two nurses, two techs, but one endoscopist jumping back and forth between, between the rooms. Not every day, but on many days um, I'll have two endoscopy rooms. So. Whereas on a good day before I, we could book, maybe I could do 14 procedures, that would be a, a peak day. Now we can get up to 18, I think we've even done 20 in a day. It's a lot, but we can do it. So not only did we improve patient access and, and allow for more patients to get into our system more quickly, um, on a marginal basis, it significantly reduced our cost per endoscopy by over $1,000. It improved physician satisfaction because one of the findings of the of the Tuck um, analysis was that 32 percent of our physician time in the endoscopy center was waiting, waiting for a patient to arrive, waiting for a room to get ready, waiting for a patient to be able to get moved out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this strategy eliminated nearly all of that wait time. So the physician satisfaction went way up. The nursing and, and other endoscopy tech satisfaction went way up. Under the old model, you can imagine this physician trying to push the system constantly rather than wait, always pushing that nurse to do that next task more quickly. And under the new system, the nurse is pulling the physician through the process. The nurse is always ready ahead of that physician and pulling, pulling the physician through the process. And so as a result of that trial where we found improved access, improved finances, improved um, physician and staff satisfaction, 
we put together a proposal for the senior leaders at Dartmouth requesting an investment in some additional staff to open up these additional rooms and it was uh, approved right away and we began within a month or so of that, that was um, last summer, within a month or so of that we began implementing. Um, by the end of October financial results, uh, the performance uh, on an RVU basis against the new benchmark, uh, gastroenterology and hepatology had moved to 95 percent of that benchmark and by the end of the year they were at 100 percent of the now new higher benchmark. Uh, one of the recommendations that we sent was you know, maybe you want to get out of DHMC because even, even if you can sort of streamline the colonoscopies within the endoscopy suite, you still have sort of the diseconomies of scope of dealing with really sick patients next door, patients who are getting EUSs next door to patients who are sort of in and out for a routine colonoscopy every 10 years. So if you can get those well patients out into a center in and of themselves with sort of an isolated, you know, unit, then you could even realize the, the economies and, and the, the productivity even more than they have in the existing space. Now we are looking at other uh, you know, avenues for doing endoscopy in other settings, either at the OSC or in our own ambulatory center. In the beginning, when we designed the two-room plan, we knew that it required a nurse, a tech, and a room for the doctor to do the colonoscopies in. So our initial plan included two nurses and two techs and two rooms. Now what we're finding is a, a, as a natural process of um, getting more efficient without necessarily planning it is we're realizing that we actually might be able to get by with only one nurse. So instead of a doctor, two nurses and two techs with two rooms, it, could, it, it, it looks like we're going to be able to move to a physician, one nurse and two techs we have a room as large as an endoscopy suite that we currently use for computer documentation. It's essentially a room with eight or so computers in there for physicians to document. One of the recommendations from the Tuck team was to convert that into another endoscopy suite and rework our systems a little bit so the physicians can do their pre and post documentation work right in the exam rooms. Essentially this project was designed to come up with uh, recommendations and strategies for the physicians in gastroenterology and hepatology to achieve their RVU benchmarks. Theoretically, the more RVUs, the more dollars that will come in. The, the RVU project worked, the physician, the you know, GI got to benchmark, and they did have a record profitable year. But there were challenges. Uh, the biggest of those was the, is that we didn't have enough recovery beds to manage now the increase in patient volume. We're working um, hard on, on the endoscopy side. We do, you know, half our time is spent in the clinic as well. Although that's we're less productive in terms of RVU, but we have to become better there as well. And it's what makes this uh, a project as opposed to just flip this light switch tomorrow, is that there are so many people involved. So the benchmark, in order to sustain our system, needed to, needed to move. And so we moved it from the 50th percentile to the 60th percentile. The initial response, um, was a little deflating. So imagine that you're a marathon runner and you take three years to train to be able to make it that 26 and some odd miles and you made it and you ran a race last year and you've finished your marathon and this year in your first race you're at mile 26 and you round the corner and you're looking up for that finish line and what you see is a sign that says, finish line, five miles ahead. It saps your energy. It, it, it reduces your motivation. 
And it takes a little bit of adjustment time to realize that, hey, I can, I can do that 31 miles. And it takes some more training and it takes some um, mental adjustment. And, that, and we all went through that. We're in fact, as a medical center, we're probably still in various stages of going through that realization. Uh, another suggestion that, uh, that we're taking advantage of is now that, now that Tuck has sort of developed this process of analysis, uh, rolling it out to other areas around the medical center, and we're currently right now working with, that I know of, three, addition, three no, more Tuck teams. Uh, one working on a cardiology project that's very similar, one working um, on an emergency department project, and one working on a project to create the Dartmouth Center for Weight and Wellness. Mm -hmm.